Welcome to Let's Talk, where Spokane Talks hosts seek out and discuss the latest on a variety of interesting topics to Spokane and North Idaho. Here's today's host, Mike Fitzsimmons. Welcome to this edition of Let's Talk. We are studying the candidates uh, in the uh, upcoming election in November, and we have with us today... Uh, Randy Michaelis, who is running for the 7th District, position number one representative. Now, this is not what you would call uh, a politician. Randy is not a politician. Randy is uh, someone who wants to make a difference. He's no kid. He's been at it for a while in the professional world, and he he seems to have discovered a calling and uh, has uh, some unique and... and, uh, somewhat tragic reasons as to why he wants to do this right. uh, but uh, welcome in any event and uh, it, it's yeah. good to have an opportunity to, to chat with you you call yourself he's running by the way as a democrat he he calls him himself a classic uh, moderate and um, when we were chatting before we, we right. went on that would be sort of a, a scoop jackson kind of person yeah, a Tom that, Foley kind of person that's uh, the kind of folks that uh, I paid attention to growing up and so, um, in fact, Tom Foley spoke at our high school at Mead in 1972 when he was a lot younger than me. And so, yeah, so we paid attention to uh, Scoop Jackson, uh, Dan Evans. He was a Dan Evans, a Republican, uh, uh, and Tom Foley. So that's where I see myself being. I don't like it when we're way out here. I like the idea that we can be here and actually sit down and solve problems with each other. So that's the kind of politician. Now, I have to correct you. Jim Camden uh, and the Spokesman Review says now we're politicians and we can't say we're not politicians anymore. <laughs> uh, <there's laughs> Once we threw our <laughs> hat in the ring, we are now politicians. There's a connotation for politician, and uh, you know anyone yeah. who seeks an office, yeah. I suppose, by today's definition, right. is a politician. I am, uh, we'll put it this way: I am a rookie politician. Yeah, yeah, and you know, so yeah. what? What uh, Randy drives uh, uh, a. Uh, a uh, interim dean at the School of Education at Whitworth to, at the age of 66, toss his hat in the ring. What, yeah. What did, what, what got that? Yeah, yeah. What happened there, right? Yeah. What, what slip of good judgment? I'm sure your family, some there. of your family members said, what, what's <laughs> right. this about? Right. Right? Well, uh, so, uh, so, it, uh, so I've worked in teacher education. So I started off as an elementary school teacher. I did that for 11 years, Deer Park, Mead. Um, uh, main, mainly the fourth grade. I still uh, fantasize about going back to the fourth grade and teaching sometime. Mm-hmm. But uh, in doing that, public education is, or education is in the public arena all the time. And so even as an elementary school teacher, you'd change governors, you'd change legislature, and you're all of a sudden you had a new set, or you'd change the head of the OSPI, you had another set of rules. And so in some ways, more than lots of professions it's in the arena and you're aware of it all the time the what tipped it for me um, for the last couple years uh, I have been very involved with accreditation with the university so I've been doing a lot of policy work very uh, and worked a lot with the state on various certifications and accreditation so I knew that policy world well last fall when the election was going on I just I uh, found myself hardly able to stay in front of the television uh, as we have had this far left and the far right just yelling at each other across this chasm yeah. that I thought, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And then, um, yeah, and then in, and so I was already interested and then in, the, uh, in June of 2016, my daughter, Caitlin, was the Gonzaga Prep Teacher of the Year. She had done that for 10 years. And, um, whew, and so and right after that, in the, in during the same time when I'm having a stomach ache in front of the television, she began to uh, have uh, this very aggressive form of mental illness come in. And so here's this very wonderful, very stable, you know, she's teaching at Gonzaga Prep. She's finishing her graduate degree. She's teaching as an adjunct for GU. She's got all these things going on. And then she became delusional 
and to the point where we uh, put her in the hospital. Um, and then what we learned there is that you would admit your, your, this person to the hospital. They would stabilize. And so Christmas of 2016, we spent the whole that time in the hospital with her. And then what would happen is they would stabilize and then release. And, and, and the first time they gave us, they said, here's all the psychiatrists in town. And by the way, you probably won't be able to see one for two months which was our case. And so that, Mike, <laughs> was really upsetting. And so, but we just spent the whole year just trying to take care of Katie. And so she took a leave of absence. And if this culminated in uh, end of October, her taking her own life. And uh, so things just got so bad. That and, and this, me <clears throat> excuse me, this mental illness and, uh, and the way in which our state our community, our country, handles mental illness um, yeah. has been a mess, yeah. just simply a totally out of control mess yeah. for a many long time. decades now. A long time. Many yeah. decades now, yeah. and these are familiar stories. Yeah. A lot of folks yeah. can tell yeah. similar yeah. types of stories. Yeah. I mean, it just you simply were not able to get the help she needed when she needed it, and uh, a rescue might very well have resulted in saving her life. And and uh, but it didn't happen that way. So now, what can you? as a state representative yeah. do to reverse the kinds of things that you endured and that others are enduring as right. we speak yeah. uh, with respect to this whole area? Well, I don't know all the answers. I do know that um, the resources that the state has been willing, and we're not alone in this, but oh, the no. No. Uh, resources and um, that the state has been willing to put in have been pretty limited. I think one of the things I hope to have happen out of this, one, I hope to win, <laughs> vote for Randy McHales, uh, but I hope that I'm also during this time a voice so that other people, and this happens to me all the time. I don't always tell the story of Katie. Sometimes I'm just talking about schooling or something, but every time I do, I have many, many people come up and tell me their story, and, that, and they are, and these kinds of things are, uh, they don't care what party you're in. Uh, so, oh. and they will tell me the story about mental illness. Oftentimes they'll tell me how addiction went with that. So alcoholism or something, because those are sure. things. And then uh, when they realize my daughter um, completed a suicide, then they, there's many, many folks who come up and want to talk about that. So part of this is to be a voice and part of it is, um, I heard a speaker this last fall. As you might imagine, we pay way more attention. I mean, I've been in education all my life, so I've always paid attention to sure. this because of who walks in the doors. The public education, we personify the Statue of Liberty. Just whoever walks in, we, are, we accept you and we're ready to work with you. But in that, during that time, I realized that there's this huge stigma that goes with this. So, during this time, my sister-in-law got cancer, and uh, she went in, and she's doing fine now, but, um, but they were able to do these testing, and they said this is exactly what it is. They had a label. They knew what stage it was. They were able to identify it. And, by the way, here's your treatment, and we'll start that on Tuesday. When you have mental illness, people don't talk about it. In fact, we don't even really call it by the name, which is it's really a brain disease, yeah. and but we... Yeah don't actually name the organ, which is interesting. I wonder what it would be if it, were, if it would be different at all if, it, if that's what we called it, a heart disease, a lung disease, a brain disease. I if we called it something very specific like that, well, it's like the other has really well, you wonder, doesn't, no definition. Don't you? Like Alzheimer's, I don't think we refer to Alzheimer's as a mental illness. That would be, I mean, I don't hear people doing that. because it is. It, in that definition, it's a, it's a, it is, but it's, it's, it's a yeah. disease of the brain. And so are so many of these but, others. But, but getting back to this political game you decided <laughs> yes, to get into, yes, yeah. uh, you would be one of, 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 a, of a small group of individuals that would be looking at these very uh, important and expensive issues yeah. and trying to set policy with respect to this. Right. Now, I see you as, as having just chatted with you for a while as a conciliator, uh, an individual who can bring people together. You don't. You you're, you're not a name caller, a rock thrower, or any no, of that no. uh, that sort of thing. Too much of that goes on already. Uh, but at, at the same time, you have to be able to persuade, in order to get a coalition together, in order to get a, right. a bill passed and such. Right. 
Uh, so the constituents who are looking at you uh, will certainly be disarmed by you, but very quickly, regardless of whether they were Republican or Democrat. But the question would be, why would we elect you? What would you do for us? Well, I'm interested in mental health, obviously, and so I would pursue those kinds of things. The committees I would probably hope to be on would be the K-12 committees and possibly higher ed. And so um, let me kind of riff off the mental health a little bit. So in my research, uh, so the 7th District is, as you know, I don't know, size of Delaware or something. So it's, it's the, one of the largest it is, legislative I mean, districts. Ge geographically, the largest in the state. In the state of Washington, so that's right. It's North Spokane and then Pondere Ferry, Stevens, and Stevens. Okanagan. Okay, and right. So it's huge. Um, so one of the problems they have is access. So down here, we, if something happens to us, we go to Sacred Heart, we go to Holy Family, we go to um, multi care, uh, one of those. If you live in the seventh, you in your remote, you have to, you have a rural hospital district, and you vote on your hospital just like you do your schools. And right now, those places are having a rough time. So when I was in Republic, um, <laughs> the candidate forum, right, uh, which is always interesting because it was also the hometown of my opponent, and so uh, <laughs> you're right there. Uh, but when we were doing our candidate presentations, the person from the hospital asked, had arranged for them to get up and speak to a new levy just to be able to deal, to manage their debt because their debt has so ballooned in the last year. Um, and so it isn't just about a small group of people that would do this. I think this is access to health care, being able to have affordable health care. I think that's a pretty, um, uh, all those people in Republic were very interested in the state of their hospital. You lose your hospital, and okay. you, lose your, you lose your Main Street, you lose your hospital, you lose your schools, you just don't have a town. Rural health care is in a perilous condition all it over is, the country. Yeah. And so There's those no are all connected, um, and I think part of what, I mean, to answer partly, to answer your question, my politician training is to answer the question I want to answer, but I'm trying That's, to answer it. Well, maybe you are a politician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe I am. Right. So I think yeah, I would like to see health care just be more inclusive of mental health care or brain disease, as we decided to call it. How deeply should the state be involved financially in this process? Well, I think part of this has to do with also what insurance companies um, are willing to do. And so... Uh, part of that is what we learned is that what Caitlin needed is that she needed we needed some help, and so we discovered Swedish uh, Hospital in Seattle, Seattle has a day program, and that would have been a wonderful thing to have had in Spokane. So a day program is designed for post hospitalization, and so what happens is you, uh, you admit them to the hospital, which we did five or six times during that year, and then they would be released, and then we would try to care for her. The day program is you bring her to the program at Swedish, and she comes in at nine and comes out at four. The problem is, I, I just told Adam, her husband, I just said, look, I'll cover this, just go do it, and uh, take leave of absence, I'll take care of the hotel, I'll just move you and the dogs to Seattle and live there while you do this, but it only goes for so many weeks. So that would have been a great program. We also discovered there's a number of networks around hospitals that are called uh, the first episode uh, centers, at first episode clinics. And so designed for people in the first year that this shows up. Well, the Northwest is kind of a desert for that. So as a legislator, I don't really have any need to raise everybody's taxes, but I would be looking around for those incentives that hospitals, insurance companies would do that. One could couple with foundations. I mean, I just watch what the Gates Foundation is trying to do around schooling. So, so I'm not a legislator sure yet, legislator yet, but those are the kinds of things I'd be looking. But to I mean, you are asking with. to be sent to the yes, Washington State absolutely. House of Representatives. I am, yes. And the Washington State House of Representatives, which is is. Uh, 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 currently uh, yeah. run by the, the early Democrat. Democratic majority, <laughs> right. uh, has a number of uh, a fiscal 
goals and yeah. objectives they wish to achieve. Indeed, left almost $4 billion worth of such goals and objectives on the table in the last legislative session because right. they, they couldn't get the votes to, to move in that direction. Yeah, right. And you're asking essentially something that they're not asking about right now relative to mental health care and, and that sort of thing. That's not on their radar at the moment. They've, that, that isn't the, the, right. their major uh, priority. They're looking at, at things like carbon taxes and things, things of that nature. Now, not that it couldn't be, but if it's right. going to be, you're going to have to be a, a, a voice I would that makes have that to be possible. A, I would have to be a very persuasive person. You would? And uh, part of that, and that's one of the reasons I ask Adam and family members uh, if I can tell Katie's story, because that is, that is not the only thing I'm running on. I'm running on other ideas. I have a lifetime of good experience. I mean, this is, I mean, I have to say, if I could have scripted out a, 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 a career that would have prepared me to run for office, it's a pretty good career for doing this. Well, yeah, and so, yeah, um, yeah, even though that was never the plan. No. So, so you're right. I do, though, Governor Inslee, and I don't always agree with everything he does, he does have a major mental health initiative going on. And yes. that would be something I would be interested in. It's not addressing necessarily the same set of issues I'm in, but it would be uh, a step in the right direction to begin this. I see this, this has got to be a marathon. I mean, think of what we did for cancer care, or uh, actually a better one would probably be addiction. We just didn't have anything 20, 30 years ago. It wasn't until Betty Ford <laughs> kind of came along and opened up that whole world that we began to have insurance for and programs and funding. And I, I think some of these um, uh, high profile suicides we've had, there's, um, we're paying attention in ways that we haven't done this. Uh, school shootings, I just, um, we, so in my research, this is actually what I was going to say, I'll finish my earlier sentence, is that I think there's 23 schools in the seventh that don't even have a counselor. And so that usually means they're too small or they're barely on the edge. And the new McCleary isn't actually funding that. We don't have a formula for how to fund that. So one solution, a really, it's not a solution, but a step in the right direction would be that every school would have somebody that's paying attention to the mental health of our students. Because we know, um, we know that's that's what's going on with school shooting. Most of the time, this has to do with Certainly mental a component health. in yeah. almost yeah. every yeah. one of those incidents. Yeah, yeah. Without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. But now, now, as long as we're on the subject of McCleary, and, yeah. and you are, you are going to be a good resource, I think, in the House if you're uh, elected because of your experience yeah. and your many years and many decades of, of, uh, of K-12 and higher education experience and leadership. Uh, one has to ask the question, we discussed this a little bit before we, uh, we uh, went on, but uh, one has to ask the question, is this just a matter of uh, how many dollars we spend on this? What is the outcomes assessment process that we're going to use to f determine whether or not those dollars actually pay? Because, uh, I mean, the return the dividends we want them to return to. It seems to be the attitude that if you just spend more money on this, it'll get better. But we've been spending more money on it, if you look historically, over the last 35 years, and it has not gotten better. So when do we turn the corner on this? Hmm. And well, how can you how can you help drive that? Right. Uh, so somewhere in the 70s, when I first started teaching, we had a court decision that created at that point uh, what we ended up calling the state salary schedule, and so that meant pretty much that you knew what you were going to be. Uh, and I moved. I was I was in three different districts, so I pretty much knew what I was going to get when I went there. Sure. And McCleary. So this was legislation in response to a lawsuit. So the lawsuit starts in 2012 and to the point where the Congress or the legislature is actually held in contempt at the tune of $100,000 a day until they solved that. Which was and just so much political theater because there, there was no yes, authority to do yes, that. I mean, yes, really. yes, yes, yes. That, well, you know that and I know that, but that's still, they, they were held in contempt. So a lot of pressure in a hurry to put this thing okay. together. Uh, will it solve all our problems? I think it's got some good things that's going to happen to it. So we're seeing more funding for special education. We're seeing more funding, I'm hoping, for things like school counselors. And we are raising the cost of the 
um, um, a living wage for the teachers who had been stuck in a position for a long time. So all of that's good. We have a lot of, I mean, if we go back to George Bush, uh, we have a lot of tests in place. And that has, uh, one has to ask if that's the best way for us to measure this. And so we've, you know, started off with the Wassel and it has progressed right. until we have a number of these exams. But because the federal government is less interested in that now than they were during the No Child Left Behind, we have uh, less pressure on that regard, and, and there was a lot of folks all along asking if this was the best way to measure how kids were learning anyway. And so uh, we could argue that, we could take another radio but, show but, from but that But clearly one. it had, had to do with uh, the, uh, the clarification of the concept of, of uh, a basic the education. Paramount, paramount duty to write and, and basic And it didn't education. achieve that. We, we don't know what basic education is now. Ask anybody over there, you know, and if you're going to be a politician, you're right. going to discover the other politicians have their own definitions. Right. Right. There is no formula that nope. is universally nope. accepted as nope. this is what basic nope. education is, right. and this is the minimum constitutional obligation that the legislature has to maintain funding. Yeah. Yeah. That was the whole theory right. of, of, uh, of the McCleary, McCleary and decision. yet at the same time, they got the money, but... They, haven't def defined the basic education objective. You, you know, uh, what we tend to do when we don't agree <laughs> is we tend to uh, either go way down here, I don't know if you've been around education long enough, but in the 70s and 80s we had student learning objectives. And so I had literally a card file with little holes in this pre-computer and I would stick my little, uh, little metal piece in there and I would pull out and all the kids who hadn't passed that little tiny SLO, student learning objective, and I would pull together and we would work on that very tiny little objective. So we either do that, we either re go into this reductionist mode where we go way down here or we go way up here. And so our, our response as legal folks has, or uh, lawmakers has been to go up here rather than down here. And we need to go back and visit that. I would, I would be delighted to take on the conversation of what basic education is. I also would be delighted to see, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but I grew up in the time where uh, lots of kids that were not going to go to college, they did automobile shop, uh, auto shop with Mr. Sure. Anderson, and they, we had sure. lots of those vocational programs. Those have, they haven't disappeared, but you go to the Mead High School today, they are not what they were to the Mead High School no. when I graduated in 1970. Right. I think that also could be part of what we consider basic education would be good vocational education. So uh, we haven't got very much time left. So okay. let me just let me just ask you yeah. quickly: When you knock on the door and face a constituent, yeah, what do you tell them? Is the reason why they should vote for you? I'm telling them right now that there's an, some urgency bec um, because of the McCleary decision for some people who actually have strong expertise in the area of education. And that would not be how I would characterize my opponent or the seventh. Uh, they seem to be good people, but they, that is not their area. Education, health care, mental health are going to be the big topics for the next few years. But what's going to happen right now in the next couple years is that we're going to make decisions on how McCleary plays out. And once that gets decided, it might be three more decades before we have another big shift in all of this. I'd like to be there to be part of that, to be part of those definitions, to, to really be able to understand what basic education is, to find that and be able to bring that to the people, not just the seven foot of the state. So you see a window of opportunity to yes. steer it in a direction and it, you want to be there. I want to be, be there to... now because right now in the, I mean, you know it is the, the so, you know, whatever it is, the, the radio station reorganizes. Well, then there's, it may have not been the most functional place forever, but it was running and ever, all the deck chairs were in the right place. Mm -hmm. And right now we tip the ship and everything's rolling and it will eventually do this again and everybody, will, it'll stabilize into a homeostasis. I want to be there, just whatever it stabilizes into is good for schools and good for kids and good for citizens as well as uh, taxpayers. Are you uh, discovering a synergy with the, with the uh, constituency with respect to these sorts of things? Are they concerned about this? Yeah, they're concerned about um, 
education when I go north they have different concerns they're also sure. concerned about their schools what yeah. is what I'm hearing from rural school districts is that McCleary created a differential differentiated uh, salary schedule which is a problem for Republic and Colville so if you live near an urban area you got a bump and so that's a bump for being as cost of living bump and we've all known uh, known for years and if you tried to if you get a job teaching Mercer Island, you cannot live on Mercer Island. You may have to go drive to North Bend before you can afford your apartment. Afford and so we, district, yeah. yeah. And so we've known that's always been a problem. But what's happened now is that Tenasket and OMAC and all those places, they don't have that incentive, which at one point we were trying to develop for rural schools, and now we've actually disincentivized teachers from going there and staying there. Well, in summation, you bring an awful lot to the table. Thank you. And uh, and I think that that's uh, important to consider the credentials that you bring and the and the uh, experiences that you have because obviously you are uh, very passionate and dedicated to this, to these areas that are so important to you. And if you need to uh, learn anything more, you have a website, of course. How do they get to that? Yep. If you want to know more about me, randymichaelis.org, R-A-N-D-Y-M-I-C-H-A-E-L-I-S. Looks like Randy Michael is org. And uh, you can go and see where I have issues and probably even watch this video if I like it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> He's Randy Michaelis, and he is running for the 7th District State Representative position number one. And that's it for this edition of Let's Talk. Let's Talk is produced in Spokane, Washington by Spokane Talks Media, which is solely responsible for its content. Ask a question, recommend a guest, and hear this program again online anytime at SpokaneTalksMedia.com. We wish you a great day.